Good evening, everyone. I'm Kevin McCarthy, the director of Parrot Memorial Library. I'm pleased that you joining us tonight for a very interesting talk. This is a program that we hold in partnership with the Garden Club of Old Greenwich, a series of programs that have been very popular and we're glad to continue this relationship. I'd like to introduce you to Martina Goshan, who is the vice president of the Garden Club to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And as re representing the Garden Club of Old Greenwich, I wish to extend our appreciation for the wonderful partnership with the Parat Library in enabling us to bring informative talks to you about the environment, gardens, and plants. So before we, I introduce our speaker, um, a note, please, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat and I will read them to uh, Bill at the end of the program so that he can answer them. Uh, so today our guest speaker is Bill Lucy. As the our Long Island Soundkeeper since 2017, Bill protects water quality, the fish and wildlife of the sound to benefit both people, the people and the sound itself. Core goals of the organization save the sound. He was raised in Wilton, Connecticut. He grew up exploring and fishing Long Island Sound before attending University of Vermont. He went on to serve the Peace Corps in Guatemala and lived in Alaska for 20 years where he worked as a federal biologist, commercial salmon and halibut fisherman, and as a municipal biologist, coastal planner. He's also an environmental educator. Becoming the Long Island Soundkeeper allowed Bill to return to his roots as he is quoted in an article from waterkeeper.org, I feel personal responsibility for its waters and the rivers that flow into it. All that the land and the sea gave me when I was a child, I've spent my adult life giving back, educating or fighting those who don't care and trying to be an effective advocate. Without further ado, welcome, Bill. All right, thank you. That was a great introduction. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen this one and start the slideshow okay so a little bit of background on my organization we're save the sound we originally were when i came on board we were connecticut fund for the environment slash save the sound slash long island soundkeeper and we decided to take that mouthful and, and restructured last year. And now we're just saved the sound, nice and simple. And we do a lot of different work. Um, we're regional bi-state group. So we do, we work in both New York and Connecticut, basically any of the waters that drain into Long Island Sound is you have to fix the watershed in order to have a healthy sound. So it's all one connection, which I'll get into a little bit during this talk. We also have a very strong climate program. There's four bills now are on the move in the Senate and the House. Uh, I do a lot of lobbying. Um, so there's a lot of hope for some progress in that, that realm at the state legislature. Uh, we're doing a lot of land preservation. Um, and we just basically are trying to get the productivity back into the ecosystem that surrounds us. And this is what we call the impact map. We're almost done with our, our new revision, which will be interactive. So if you go to our website, you can click on any of these icons and it's gonna give you information of what it means. But in general, these are the different buckets that we operate in. We have a number of attorneys, not all of them are involved in litigation, but we do use the Clean Water Act, the citizen provision of that in order to combat pollution. We try and get things accomplished without going to court, but sometimes uh, you need to use the laws of the land to clean things up. The pollution action icon is uh, reports we get from citizens like you. Uh, there'll be a spill, something smells bad, there'll be oil in the water. Uh, we'll go out, we'll investigate and take samples. We have a, a brand new lab that we just unveiled a couple weeks ago in Larchmont. And we have a big water quality monitoring pro program out of that. All the little orange dots are bacteria samples that we use a host of volunteers to collect. And then all the orange bays 
that you see on both Long Island and New York City area and Connecticut, those are all citizen groups, two dozen of them now in over 40 bays and harbors. And they monitor the water quality um, every two weeks. So we're putting together a huge baseline data and we give that information to uh, the federal agencies and the state agencies for management. We're also involved in green infrastructure. We do a lot of rain gardens and bioswale to clean up stormwater. Uh, I mentioned before land preservation. We're uh, making very good progress on Plum Island out at the end by the eastern part of the sound. Uh, we're hoping to get that converted to a national monument so people can once again go and visit Plum Island. Right now it's a facility, disease facility that's being shut down and they don't allow people on the, on the island. Um, and then fish passage is near and dear to me as a fish biologist by training. We have a half dozen fish uh, passage projects right now. Actually, there's seven. There's another one up here in the Naugatuck. And that's to get the forage fish species from the sound through the estuaries and wetlands and then up into the interior watershed. And then uh, cleanups. We do over 70 beach cleanups all over the, the Connecticut coastline with around two to 2,500, um, 2,000 to 2,500 volunteers. So I am gonna talk about the whole, um, let's see what's going on with this, the entire, basically the, the, the estuaries, the wetlands, the, the reefs, the eelgrass beds and the forest all, all come together. And for some reason, the picture of my son playing at Sherwood Island did not come through on this one. But I wanna start where I think we should all start. And that's the history of Long Island Sound. And by history, I mean the geologic history. How did it get here? Why is it the way it is today? Um, and what can we expect in the future? So if you go back 30,000 years ago, a lot of the water on the planet was locked up in ice. So this is all land. So beyond Long Island, this was all land out on the continental shelf. And the ice came down in the last ice age and it stopped at Long Island. And as it came back, it would made what's called an end moraine. And that is what Long Island is. It's just the bulldozer of ice came down, ground up the, the, the ground in front of it, pushed all the boulders and sand in front. The rivers sorted it. That's why I have a lot of sandy beaches over there. And there now you have a lake. And I've seen a lot of these in Alaska. And when, what's going on here is an outburst event. And I've seen a couple of these. They're incredible. Where something breaks and the whole lake just empties. And as that ice melted back, things got warmer, things melted, the land rebounded from the ice pressing it down. Here we go. We have Long Island Sound salt water and that's where we are today. So what I'm gonna go through are the types of wetlands and ecosystems associated with them in Long Island Sound, the values and functions of those. I'm gonna to touch on blue carbon as a concept. Um, the the natural history and the benefits of all the wetlands and estuarine wildlife um, and how the ecosystems function with them and the physical functioning and then the human impacts that we're having on these habitats and then what we could do about it to maybe have a more sustainable future. So these are the types of wetlands and I'm sure people can guess which one is not yet in Long Island Sound. Maybe someday we'll have mangroves, but um, salt marshes are the most prevalent. If you get beyond the tidal range, freshwater marshes are extremely important as well. Uh, seagrass beds, and I see Rob Vasilis is on here. He's our local expert eelgrass restoration guy. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that because uh, these eelgrass beds are just, they're incredible carbon sinks and then forested swamps. So where you see wood ducks around here, maybe some black ducks, those are very important for sediment movement, water cleaning before it gets to Long Island Sound. And just to mention, Patrick Lynch is credited at the bottom here. He was a medical illustrator at Yale University and retired and he's done some amazing books about natural history, including the field guide, the Long Island Sound. And he, these are all his paintings. And 
um, he's allowed us to use at Save the Sound to use his uh, images. Here are some more of his things, his uh, pictures. So, coastal wetland and function. Move this out of the way. So, one of the big things about these wetland areas adjacent to open water is that they're incredible nutrient cyclers. So the saltwater tide wedge comes in and mixes up the fresh and salt water and the sediments. And it just creates what I call an energy, like a battery pack for Long Island Sound. The Long Island Sound itself is an estuary and all these wetlands and river mouths are smaller estuaries that just give it lots of electrical energy, lots of energy. And so the fish and wildlife come in there, there's lots of food, for their young to eat. There's a lot of protection for them to breed. Um, fish, birds, crabs, everybody uses these, all the creatures use these habitats. And then with the carbon sinking in here, it's, it's really remarkable. The nitrogen comes out of our rivers and I'll get to a reason why that is. And a lot of it gets absorbed right here at the mouth of the river. That's where a lot of it's being taken out. Wetlands are also incredibly important for shoreline protection and they can stop waves, they can absorb flooding, um, all of this type of uh, services, uh, protecting real estate. Um, they, the reason they improve water quality is because they trap sediments. They're home to oysters and clams that filter a lot of the particulates out of the water. And it's just nice, Connecticut coastline is getting crowded. And if you want that open space and you don't have a boat to get out onto the sound, you know, if you can get around one of our beaches or wetland areas, you get these large expanses that can't be built on because they flood on the tide and you get that sense of freedom and openness. And of course, they're great places to fish. Um, I used to catch snapper blues and fiddler crabs and go birding in the wetlands around here. They're very rich. So, um, the food web that I talked about is very complex and it's changing. And to illustrate that, we have 120 species of fin fish in Long Island Sound. Over 50 of those species do the spawning part of their lifestyle within the sound. And now we're getting tropical fish. Um, we even have um, trigger fish and things like that show up nowadays on a semi regular basis. So Things are changing, and, and what's what's happening with that on the on the small macroplankton level, we're getting shift in copa, copepod species, which are kind of the base of the food chain. They're little microscopic clams that a lot of different things eat when they're larvae. We all remember the lobster die off. Things are getting warmer. Um, there's pesticides. There's pollution that changed a lot of things. Uh, Manhattan. We've seen incredible runs of Manhattan in uh, Long Island Sound. Two years ago, it was, it was solid Manhattan from Watch Hill all the way to the Bronx. I took a boat ride for about two hours and I had reports coming in from all over the sound. The whole sound was full. So there's a lot going on. There's a lot changing. Um, and some of it is not good. So this gets to where what we're talking about today is the wetlands and the wetland loss. So in the 1880s, you could see in the red what Long Island Sound used to look like. There was a lot of people that made their living um, harvesting salt hay. And the reason salt hay was so popular is that if you put it in your garden bed to mulch, it didn't have any weed seeds because it needed the salt. So you wouldn't have any weed problems if you could get yourself some salt hay. By the 1970s, <coughs> we had lost about 70% of it. And we've lost completely. This means buried and built on a third of the wetlands in Long Island Sound. That's why they're so important, the ones that are remaining. Um, and I'm gonna get to the sediment part next. And I got for Rob, I'm putting in the eelgrass here. So we're looking at about a 90% loss of eelgrass. And eelgrass is an incredible, incredibly productive habitat that sinks more carbon than most other habitats in the world and is incredibly important for forage fish and other species. Um, and we were recently at a, a, a meeting, a 31st annual meeting 
hosted by the EPA on eelgrass and Long Island SAM. And the researchers are saying, we have to get something figured out in the next decade or we are gonna lose eelgrass completely in the sound. So we're really reaching some tipping points. And so why is this happening? Well, we have been building a lot in Connecticut over the years. And this picture on the right is impervious cover. So this is a, what's called a LIDAR photo. It's a elevation photo. And the state has taken this, actually Yukon Clear, the land use think tank they have, and all this is impervious cover. So when it rains on the yellow, it shoots off as, uh, as instant runoff. This all used to be forested or more importantly, wetlands and wetlands can take a lot of water before it starts moving out. Now you can harden the landscape so it's not a forest anymore and we're getting lots of localized flooding and any of the pollutants that are on the street, the sand, the salt, the cigarette butts, the oil drippings, the brake dust, bits of asphalt, that's all getting blasted into the sound in our estuaries every time we get a good rain. Over on the left-hand side is an example of what our ecological restoration team does. So this, de this device down here is catching the runoff from a parking lot, and these plants here will filter out a lot of those pollutants, and you can pick up any bottles and things that get caught in it. Another impact that's happening to the, the wetlands is the loss of sediment transport. So the, the picture on the right are all the known dams in Connecticut. There's over 4,000 of them. The letters below just rate how safe they are um, or unsafe they are. But all these rivers used to run free and they would transport sand and pebbles and rocks. So as sea level went up or down, the marshes would go up and down because they had this material to, to stay in sync with what was happening with the ocean levels. This picture on the left is actually from the Norwalk Wilton border area. It's the flock process dam on the Norwalk River that Fish and Wildlife Service, I believe the city of Norwalk led this one. Um, I went down to check it out. Uh, I'm a big fan of the Norwalk River. I grew up fishing it many, many years for opening day at trout season when I lived in Wilton. And this opened the river all the way up from Long Island Sound to Wilton at Merwin Meadows. And our team is just about to take down the dam at Merwin Meadows, which means it'll open the Norwalk River all the way up to Georgetown by the old wire mill. Um, which is a really wild place, which at one point was the oldest continuous operating business in the country. Um, so that opens up miles of habitat to fish that haven't been there since this colonial flock dam was built. And it also is going to allow a lot of sediment to go downstream and hopefully rebuild some wetlands or make the marina owners mad because it's going to fill their slips in quicker. Um, and then pollution is what's stressing the whole system out. So if you look on the left, you had the last coal burning plant in Connecticut. Um, that's going to get decommissioned soon. There's a, a more efficient gas plant next to it. Everybody knows that scene down there on I-95. We've all sat in traffic for hours on behind an accident. And all those exhaust pipes are putting stuff on the pavement, the nitrous oxide, sulfur oxides up in the air. If it's raining, it all comes down on the sound and on the landscape. And then over here, we have the, uh, what's called a combined sewer overflow with the toilet paper and the, the, the sewage mixed with rainwater. We still have six towns in Connecticut that have antiquated systems where the, the rainwater runoff and the sewage runoff all go to the sewage treatment plants in a combined flow. And when you get these more intense rainfalls we've been experiencing, the plant, the sewage plants can't handle it. So they are permitted to dump this rainwater mix with sewage directly into Long Island Sound or the Connecticut River. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's a big source of nitrogen and pollutants and we're finding also PFAS. And this is the whole Long Island Sound. Long Island Sound really starts in, in Quebec and New Hampshire. So all this water up here drains down into the Sound. This is the biggest portion of the watershed. So it's really important while we're trying to fix the water quality and the habitats in Long Island Sound, this picture of a forested area with clean water and, and good shade and a healthy riparian buffer zone, it's critical to have that land management all in this area 
in order to protect Long Island Sound. Some people don't make that connection, but um, it's you have to fix the watershed if you want to fix the sound. And how out of how to balance are we? So this is some, some EPA information as part of a project, a review project that's been ongoing to set nitrogen limits, part of the Long Island Sound Nitrogen Action Plan. And we've done a great job in Connecticut. We had a target 17 years ago of reducing uh, the nitrogen by 58.5%, and we've done that. Uh, we reduced our plants average four milligrams per liter. There's more getting upgraded now. Um, in Massachusetts, they weren't under that mandate. So they're dumping a lot of nitrogen. Um, I don't think they have the same mandates in um, New Hampshire either or Vermont. So we're still getting lots of nitrogen. There's still a lot of people throwing a lot of fertilizer on the ground. And what this is, chlorophyll, the first bar, chlorophyll micrograms per liter, that's just the green color and the, the plankton that you see. You know, when you go swimming in the sound, it's kind of like pea soup sometimes. So that we can measure. And this usually in the national estuaries in our country, it, it re registers around seven. Long Island Sound averages 20, three times the av what it should be. Dissolved oxygen, average numbers nationally, 5.4. That's fantastic. The fish can breathe, all of that. Long Island Sound, one. That's when things are gasping for air. It's not zero, it's anoxic, not hypoxic. Um, so we still have events where this is going on. This is like the worst of the worst. And then the nitrogen loading in 10,000 kilograms per year, average you get about 600, 600 of those units dumping in, we're at 50,000. So again, this is the exhaust. This is natural leaf litter. This is septic tanks, cesspools. This is sewage treatment plants, lawn fertilizer, farm fertilizer, um, and it's overtax the system greatly. And then I was uh, gonna mention a little bit about harvesting. Now, I, I was a commercial fisherman for many years, 17 years I held various fishing permits for salmon, shrimp, halibut. Um, and I believe commercial fishing is a sustainable practice. Uh, right now in the legislature, they're looking at banning horseshoe crab collection completely in the Long Island Sound only about 12 people that still do it, um, but the numbers have just been crashing. Um, there's also a lot of people walking on the beaches where the eggs are, which in my opinion is probably taking a greater toll on the baby horseshoe crabs than the fishermen you know, taking some for bait. But um, that I believe passed the Senate yesterday. So I think horseshoe crab harvest will be banned in Connecticut uh, at the end of session. Um, eelgrass seeds. So the Atlantic Brant were the ones that spread a lot of those seeds. And when the numbers of Brant went down from over harvest, there were less Brant moving eelgrass seeds around, mixing up the genetics, keeping everything vibrant. So you have to have all parts of the system in order to have it function. Um, clams and oysters. So if you take out all the clams and oysters, if you harvest your lease down to nothing, all that function of the clams and the oysters filtering out the particulates, and um, absorbing nitrogen and nutrients and being harvested and sustainably and that nitrogen being exported um, to someone's dinner plate is lost. And then with the wetlands, forage fish really key in on those places. Um, if you don't have forage fish, you can have things like turn failures, uh, nesting failures, which we had a few years ago out of the Great Gull Island. Um, so what, what are we gonna do? That's terrible, everything's awful. We're, we're, we're doomed, but you know we still do have salt marshes and we know better ways to fix them. So uh, we need to protect what little we have left. And we need to, if you're gonna dredge something, you have to fix something somewhere else. And just because of the number of ecosystem services that these wetlands provide, you need to, you need to have an equal, and, um, mitigate, an equal mitigation strategy if you're gonna damage them. And the ones that are damaged, we should really be fixing up what we can fix up. It's very easy to destroy a watershed or a wetland. I mean, think of the amount of real, what the cost of real estate is, uh, say in Westport. And think of the amount, well, let's say we're gonna restore the wetlands there. You're talking a few million dollars worth of, a, versus a few billion dollars of development. 
So how would we as a society really gonna value these habitats? And we, I think personally, I think we have a little bit of a skewed view of the cost benefit ratio there. Um, so these are some of the blue carbon eco ecosystems. These are the main ones. These are the biggest carbon sinks, mangroves, which we don't have, salt marshes, which we do have, and then seagrass beds, these zoestra, these, these eelgrass beds that the sea turtles love to eat, that the manatees eat, that the brant eat, that the herring spawn on in Alaska, and they cover the seagrass, the eelgrass with eggs, millions of eggs. It's incredible to see. What happens with these species is they grab carbon out of the air, they put it into their roots, and the sediment comes in and buries it, and then the marsh migrates up, and they grab more carbon. So what they're doing is basically pumping carbon into the muck and the mire, and it's gone from the atmosphere. And they do it at such a fast rate that per acre, these are some of the biggest carbon, even more than a lot, most forests, these ecosystems are, are stabilizing the climate. So if we get them back to their formal product productivity and glory, it's gonna go a long way with all the other things we're trying to do to balance out the carbon equation um, to try and mitigate some of this change. So as I mentioned before, aquaculture can be a, a, a role, have a, a strong role in rebalancing the sound. So the farm river on the left, that's all wild oysters in there by Brantford. On the right is Black Rock Harbor, where I keep my boat. That's right near an outfall pipe for Bridgeport. Take some of Fairfield Trumbull and Bridgeport sewage. It's a 60 million gallon a day plant. Um, there's nothing living in that stuff right there. Um, so how do we deal with, with, with uh, all of that? We've got the good and we have the bad. So as I mentioned before, Save the Sound, it has an ecological restoration team that does green infrastructure. This is Sunken Meadow State Park over on Long Island. Save the Sound took an old nasty asphalt parking lot and converted it to this. And off to the side, you can see some retention ponds that are filtering water before it gets into the salt marsh. You can see these tree wells, plant wells, so water that runs onto the blacktop here for parking goes down into these and gets filtered. Um, there are trees planted along here. You can see all the filtration system here. The whole intent of this is to make that parking lot act more like a forest and a marsh combined. So this is what we should be doing to all the rye play land needs this, all the Walmart parking lots need this. We have a lot of parking lots that we can convert to part of the solution instead of part of the problem. And another thing to get to solutions is having people aware of what's going on. So Save the Sound came up with a new product um, called the Sound Health Explorer a couple of years ago. And what you can do is you can zoom into this to your favorite beach and click on the dots. And this is taking EPA data from their what's called their WQX database. And we extract, we have a software program that extracts it and displays it as a dot. And you can click on one of these. It'll tell you what your grade is for your beach. You can go back retrospectively, some beaches 10 years and see if there is um, good ratings, bad ratings. And we use this to go to areas like here by Port Chester, which are getting bad grades. We know there's a sewage problem, some kind of cross contamination in there. So we'll go in and test around that area and work with public works, enter a lawsuit if we have to, but we wanna turn these, red, these orange and red dots green. That's the whole goal of this. And so what this tool is to educate and empower the citizenry to go and look at these problems themselves. Um, on a large planning scale, I'm part of the Connecticut Shellfish Restoration Committee that's run by Sea Grant. Um, so they're looking at restoring a lot of the natural shellfish bed areas in the Sound, Connecticut. Um, and one of the things they're looking at is protecting and enhancing the shoreline wetlands with reefs. So as our wetlands are getting eroded as sea level comes up, if you can imagine a coral reef, it would be the same thing. They form a barrier around an atoll and the water is nice and calm behind that. Well, if you could build up these oyster reefs just offshore, 
Um, you can have also rib muscles really do well mixed in with the Spartina grass. If you have an eelgrass bed mixed in out there as well, attenuating some of the wave, you could really have a giant filtration system and a wave dissipation energy calming system and we can start rebuilding some of this. And one of the things they're working on is uh, a model. And the one down here, this takes a, a whole range of factors and weights them. And then it tells the restoration managers, groups like Say the Sound, where a good place it is to invest your money for successful restoration. You don't wanna try and throw money at the red, it's probably gonna fail. You wanna start with the low hanging fruit and make sure your techniques are good and work in the green areas and try and bolster those out. And those green areas will then heal the areas adjacent to them and you can move out. Um, you can see here, this is a seaweed mapper that was done for Long Island Sound, the same concept. And the water quality is really only good enough for seaweed if you go east of New Haven. Um, we're hoping to change that, but. And then you have to work with the existing stakeholders to be part of the solution. So this is part of the oyster fleet. It's over a over $30 million industry now. I know a lot of the oyster uh, harvesters and growers on the sound, some are all wild, some do kind of wild ranching, some are doing cages um, and they're moving a lot of product. And so just leaving oysters out there doesn't remove the nutrients, but if you're removing them and taking them to market, you are removing a lot of that and then bringing the shell back in um, I should, there's a picture I'm going to add to my next time I do this on the Quinnipiac River. There's a pile of shell like two stories high and long as a football field that uh, Cops Island Oysters uses to um, put their spat on. And this is what they can do. So the bottom on the left is all the sediment and the goo and the dust that's on the, the bottom. And during COVID, none of these guys uh, are, and women could sell any of their products. The restaurants were all shut down. So all these oysters started overgrowing and getting beyond market size. And they were going to go out of business. So the government hired them to go in and sift and clean all these areas, get the silt off of them, and then take the oversized breeding oysters and some shell stock and throw them down to rejuvenate the bottom. So you can see a before and after here. Same with the sound school. They're getting into reef restoration. This is the sound school uh, right here. And then this is their oyster reef, um, potential wetland restoration right here. So they've got the students mixing cement, scuba diving, doing scientific measurements and recording what's going on with those oyster reefs. And every year they're gonna keep adding to it. Um, here's another version of that right next to shore. So these reef balls are right in close to this, this wetland dune restoration. This is the Audubon Society at Stratford Point. There's uh, Joe Gresco there, uh, who, had, who used to be Terry Backer's campaign manager. And Terry Backer was the original Long Island Soundkeeper. So we've been good friends for the last five years. He's a representative up at the state legislature. And we do a lot of work together to try and uh, improve the environment scene. He's there planting some native, native grasses. Uh, City Island Oyster Reef is another project we're working in. They've got shells over at the Pelham Landfill, um, and it's just a group of citizens, and they're working really hard to restore that area of the sound used to just be full of oysters. So the Billion Oyster Project, which is in New York City, is coming out from underneath the Throg Neck Bridge and heading over towards City Island, the Bronx, and hope we will end up having a big row a giant reef of oysters with some really nicely rehabilitated salt marshes behind it. Uh, this is another uh, interesting way to go about utilizing the excess nutrients in the sound. Bryn Smith used to be a commercial fisherman. He's with Green Wave. Uh, so he's been harvesting kelp and um, also growing scallops and oysters and other things. So he's really experimenting with some intensive aquaculture on the sound. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how that all plays out. It's still kind of, it's getting there, but it still has a ways to go with market development and that sort of thing. Um, I wanted to play this. Uh -oh. 
What happened to that? Link is not working. Let me uh, see if it's over here. Bill, maybe we can, um, if you want to come out of screen share, we could open it in a separate. Okay. Yeah, let me see if a I separate can screen. do that. Let's see here. Where is screen share now? Well, oh, I see it. Okay, stop. Yeah, there. you'd have to. There we go. Is there sound in there in this yeah. video? Okay, so yeah. just make sure when you go to screen share that you check off the box um, right now as you go through it. There's a box that lets you uh, include sound at the bottom oh. left. Okay. So should I go back to open it up? Okay, I'll go ahead and try and open it up this way. There it goes. Pause it and then minimize. Screen share. Perfect. Check that sound box off at the bottom left. Share sound. Perfect. Share. Okay. So this is uh, the brainchild of Rob Vasilev. Come up with this technique to glue eelgrass seeds to clams because of the natural relationship between clams and eelgrass beds. The clams keep the root system aerated, and they also the waste from the clams digesting food is food for the eelgrass. For both the clams and the eelgrass to clarify the water. The eelgrass needs to have light coming down at a certain amount. So what we're doing here is we're being trained by Cornell Cooperative Extension in Suffolk County, who are eelgrass experts. And this team is harvesting eelgrass seeds from the eastern end of the sound. So there's an eelgrass bed. And um, they have these shoots on the end of them that have to stir seeds. So our divers went in there and grabbed some bags. And we hope to do this for four or five days this summer um, and try some more planting. Rob has, I think, four locations now. That's my boat. There's Rob there. Um, and we're going to try and ramp this up. Try and have a little bit of fun with our um, with our work. Okay, so I'm going to stop share now and go back to the slideshow. Okay, next slide. So I also mentioned um, coastal cleanups. Uh, one thing marshes do is they catch a lot of trash and it's really hard to clean it out of them with bits of styrofoam and that sort of thing. Um, so you, you can see the 4,636 tiny foam pieces. That's pretty much styrofoam uh, or polystyrene. Um, and COVID kind of threw some things off for us, but we're getting back, back up on um, I think we're going to have 76 cleanup events this year is what's scheduled. Some of them are corporate events like Subaru is really good with supporting us. Some are just local groups that want to do it, fraternities, um, any number of um, organizations like to clean up the beaches. So, And what's really good about the way we collect the data on this is an aside is that when the straw bands go into effect, the plastic bag bands go into effect, and there's a bill now to ban single-use styrofoam, uh, we'll see that litter type disappear from our beach cleanups. So the, the first year after the plastic bag ban in Connecticut, which was kind of relaxed due to COVID, we saw a pretty good drop in plastic bags on the beach. So it, it's just a testament that policy um, 
does work if it's applied correctly. Um, so actions for protecting and restoring the wetlands and the estuary. So we've got to protect what little we have left. We need to build back the eelgrass beds. Um, we need to keep the coastal forests that remain intact and start really ramping up the oyster reefs. Um, we need to start disconnecting our impervious habitat. So, I mean, our, our impervious cover. So when that rain falls on a roof, it goes into a rain barrel or goes into uh, a bioswale in our yard. Um, all the dams that serve no purpose but to heat up the water and catch mud um, should all be removed to get that natural sediment flow. Um, marine debris cleanups, keep doing that. Good plastic policy. And then work with the industry, work with the fishermen, work with the aquaculture people and the restoration folks and, and just come up with a really highly productive, sustainable use of getting food out of Long Island Sound. So what can you do by yourself? Well, we hope you will join groups in your local groups in your area or look into joining Save the Sound, at least sign it up for a newsletter to stay to current, current, you know, do all the recycling, try and reduce the amount of uh, waste that you're creating in the first place. Um, try and install some kind of water interception device to protect the stormwater system. Um, use paper versus plastic if you can. Um, be smart about how you use your garden fertilizer. Use little bits. If you're going to uh, use lawn and garden fertilizer at all, uh, use little bits at proper times. Don't just let the company go out there and dump as much as they want and charge you for it. Um, try and use non-toxic products. If you're planting stuff, plant native species. Uh, keep a watchful eye on the wetlands in your area and um, just enjoy, enjoy what we do have. And please, if you see anything um, nefarious going on, we work very closely with um, the conservation enforcement people as well as the state and federal agencies. Um, and we all help each other to, um, if there's some bad actors out there. Like I found, I got a report from a guy, someone had just dumped like 30 tires in a wetland off of I-95. Took some doing to get the police interested, but we finally got them a ticket. But those kinds of things really make a difference over time. So that's the presentation. So I guess we can, I can stop sharing and um, go to uh, any questions in the chat. So right now, Bill, we have just one question in the chat. Uh, hopefully people will add more, but um, it was a question about what are the names of the town that allow that combination of uh, water, water drainage and sewage combination that overwhelms them? <clears throat> yeah, it's a good question. That, it's not so much that they allow it, it's that they are the most difficult ones to fix because they're the densest and have the least amount of resources. So, um, you have Norwich, Connecticut. You have uh, New Haven, Connecticut. You have Hartford. You have Bridgeport. You have West Haven and you have Norwalk has a couple. We just found one. Actually, there was a big one that wasn't even known. Um, and they have one that's not permitted right now that we're trying to deal with. And it's, it's kind of emergency bypass. Um, so there's still six, there were 18, and the states invested well over $2 billion in upgrading that through their Clean Water Fund, which is a really progressive um, program compared to most states. So if you're a combined sewer overflow CSO community, you can, and say you have like Bridgeport, a $250 million upgrade that's needed, you can get 50% of that in grants and 50% of that, this is roughly, you have to come up with some of your own money and the town has to authorize bonding and all of that, but 50% of low interest loan. That's why it's called a state revolving loan fund. And the state puts in way more than the feds do through the clean water uh, program. So uh, we've really been pushing, that's why we have four milligrams per liter of nitrogen coming out. That's why we've eliminated almost all the phosphorus coming out of the sewage treatment plants 
is because the state for the last 15 years um, have really done a good job of getting those plants funding and design work to upgrade. So we're not swimming in sewage. That being said, uh, we worked really hard on two different sessions to upgrade the sewage right to know law so you can publicly know what's going on. And we asked them, one thing we asked them was to do an annual report instead of sifting through this database. And I added up all the spills, the combined sewer overflow and spills from last year. And it was something like 860 million gallons in Connecticut. So, and I've heard it gets up to a billion sometimes. So that's how much, how many gallons of contaminated water still in this day and age we're putting in. Imagine what it was when there was 18 towns doing it. Um, okay, I see some more questions popping up. So are there citizen seedings of oysters in the Connecticut Sound? If so, where and how to get involved? Great question. So um, the, the, uh, the Department of Aquaculture, excuse me, the Connecticut Bureau of Aquaculture is very cautious about putting oysters and clams around because there's a number of vibrios and different diseases um, that if you get a bad oyster in the market, you can cause a lot of economic damage to the industry if someone eats a bad oyster and dies. And that happened when I, a little bit before my time in Alaska, they had a huge canning pack of pink salmon. And uh, there was a bad batch that made it to England and one, one older fellow died from eating a bad can of salmon and they had to recall the whole pack. It was brutally expensive for the fish and fleet and the operators. So, but that's changing. So with, through the Connecticut uh, Shellfish Recovery or Restoration Program that I had to slide on, we have had discussions about this. And I think there's some interest down in Rye maybe. There's some group, there's a group down there. Um, I know we can do it in New York. Um, and I think we can start doing it fairly soon in Connecticut. We just have, there's gonna have to be rules. Like you can't get seed from farther than 10 miles away or something, just so you don't spread disease around. But I think it would be a great way to connect people. You can ha hang a bag of oysters off your dock. That would help the water quality. And, you know, it would also just get the kids and everybody involved and, and part of it. So that's a great question. So, um... Someone asked here, what is the status of Greenwich, Greenwich sewage spillage? Um, I haven't looked recently. I know they updated their, I don't know if there was a recent spill. Um, there is, um, Greenwich is interesting because the uplands are protected. You guys have done a really good job of that. You have a very active shell fisherman in the area, Atlantic Clam Company. And you have about 61% of your bottom is covered with oysters and clams and actively fished and managed. So my understanding is that shell fishing operation and the fact the sewage treatment plant's been upgraded and you have some good protected chunks of forest and maybe some larger estates that aren't you know, full of housing developments that um, you're removing over 100% of the nitrogen that you're contributing to Long Island Sound. I think it's the only community on the Sound. That was, those were calculations done through the Long Island Sound study bioextraction specialist, I don't know, four or five years ago. So yeah, Greenwich is doing great. <laughs> you guys are, are keeping it pretty clean over there. So uh, what's involved with water testing for, for shellfish harvesting? So, um, we're looking at uh, DEC has requirements that you have to test for five years in order to reopen a shellfish bed, and that's in New York. So the, the, we have closed beds right on the other side of Greenwich, right? And Westchester has been closed for years, um, and there's been a number of upgrades going on. We have an ongoing massive lawsuit over there with 11 towns, and they found well, 13,000 different defects in their system, leaking sewage essentially. And their work, a lot of towns are really doing a good job of settling and then get, getting things fixed. And so as that area starts to clean up, um, we're offering to do the work for the state because they are not doing it. So we have to go out all year 
um, and do a series of samples and send them to a New York State certified lab. Um, and then if they if we pass muster, then we can open those beds again. Um, in Connecticut, there it's it's problematic because there's not that many labs. There's one um, up in up near Hartford, I believe, and then another one um, in Milford. So if you're trying to go out and, and get testing for your own product, you got to drive samples quite quite a ways. So uh, there's a question about uh, how to explain parking lot transformation. How is that done? Yeah, so if you're familiar with the Rye Playland parking lot, let's say, for example, it's kind of got this broken asphalt, the water runs off of it, sheet flows into that pond and then into the sound. So what you would do is you would come up with a design that munches that asphalt in much like road building you, you grind it all up and mix it with fresh stuff so that would be your parking area you can also use impervious cover i mean excuse me you could use uh permeable cement but the problem with that in near a beach is it's sandy so it, that takes a lot of maintenance you need a vac truck for that but the other option is to make nice parking places slope everything so all the runoff goes into tree wells and bioswales where the plants can catch all the bottles and trash and all the runoff uh, any oil drippings and that type of thing so instead of the water running off the parking lots into a stream or a lake it's all being captured on site by these these uh, low spots and treated it's called best management practice and you can put trash grates on them to catch all the litter there's a number of different designs so where would one go to find out about those designs? So right now, um, I was part of the uh, task force, uh, the non-agency group that was writing the, uh, rewriting the uh, Connecticut stormwater guide and erosion control guidelines. It's a big, boring technical book, but it's about all the different things. Like if you're building a, a highway or you're building a new house or a, a construction area, all the latest and greatest designs for treating and their costs and longevity and maintenance and all that. Um, New Jersey's got phenomenal um, data on that. New Hampshire actually has a stormwater university, a stormwater center um, that you can Google and they are, they are cutting edge. They've, they're experimenting all the time. Um, if you wanna reach out to me directly, um, maybe I can connect you with some of that information um, my, I could put in the chat my email, or if you guys want to share it, I can do it right now. Hope that helps. Okay. Um, we have a thank you uh, uh, from a, a gentleman for your understanding and helping us all understand uh, our most important ecological needs for all people and wildlife. Thank you. So the next question is, is there tagging of horseshoe crabs still going on? Yes, yes, Project Limulus is still going. Um, and they're the ones that have been leading the charge for uh, just banning of harvest. Um, and that, like I said, I'm pretty sure that's gonna pass. Um, and they're the ones actually collecting the data for the state now. So they have an agreement with them. So that's, that's still going on, it still needs to go on. They've got an incredibly robust data set the great work that Sacred Heart's been doing. Um, there's a question, where is the next rain garden going in place? I guess with right. the, the, the state. Uh, we're doing uh, the next one that I know for sure is in Rye. Not right. Connecticut, but we are, we actually, um, we have a partnership with the city of Bridgeport, the, um, the Metro COG, the council of governments that Bridgeport's part of, Roundworks Bridgeport, um, which is a, um, a local group that uh, works with youth. And there we are gonna be doing uh, storm drain murals and also citing 60 spots in Western the west end of Bridgeport to capture runoff from the roads on city property. So we're gonna train the kids with uh, survey technique, GPS technique, um, and preliminary like 10% design. 
to try and teach them some of those architectural engineering skills. These are high school kids. Um, and um, and then once we have those, we'll, we'll go ahead and apply for more funding to do a pretty big swath of bioswales in Bridgeport. That's one of those CSO communities. So um, should we be planting more eelgrass in the Greenwich Shore areas? So there is an eelgrass, um, there's an eelgrass, uh, how would you say, it's a model, I guess, it's kind of old now, it's from 2013, that was done by Cornell and Yukon, and um, they have metrics about how clear the water is, temperature, wave action, uh, bottom type, you need a certain mix of sand and clay, um, so I, I I'm not sure how well, I don't know if there's eelgrass in Greenwich. If anybody knows, I'd love to hear about it and we'll go dive on it and, and check it because the model says things aren't going to live past Smithtown Bay. Basically, Bridgeport to Smithtown Bay is the zone where it's still potentially marginal for it. Um, and that's again 2013 data. The west end of the sound, I mean, we, the technique using the clams is pretty aggressive, so it may succeed in some areas that are a little more marginal because the, the clams create their own microclimate. They help heal the sediment and get rid of the hydrogen sulfides and stuff, hopefully. So I don't know. I mean, um, I think the work that I'm doing with Rob, if we can you know, get some more plantings in some different areas, um, I, and, and we keep cleaning up the water, uh, it'd be great to start experimenting all over. Cause really you could take 50 clams, glue some seeds with a school group and just throw them in. And if they grow, it tells you a lot. So not yet, but hopefully soon. So there was a comment here uh, um, from uh, a lady. Yes, eelgrass is at Greenwich Point Beach further beyond the concession area. So that might be something to look at. Really? Mm -hmm. you, uh, now this is underwater grass, right? Um, grass lives underwater. It's not the stuff on the shoreline. Oh, wow, great. So and where says, was yeah. that exactly? It's on Greenwich Point Beach, beyond the further beyond the concession area. Okay, I know about where that is. And same question. So a couple of people asked, or one person asked, um, people are collecting oyster shells after eating them. So you know, where to donate, or um, what do we do with the clean oyster shells? So I do know that there is a program the state's trying to get going. Um, and I mean, you can give them to Norm Bloom. That's the guy that has this huge pile. I mean, he moves them around front end loaders. Um, that's a good question. It's not really that developed yet, um, unless you're going to do your own restoration project. Um, you can keep stockpiling them for a while if you if you have a place that the city will let you do it because they do kind of smell. Or you can donate. You could talk to any of the oyster growers. Maybe talk to the Atlantic Clam Company um, operator out of Greenwich and see if he wants any. It's still so in its nascent stages, that shell collection. So what do they do with the shells when they collect them? So they have to leave them out to kill any disease and get any like growth on them, barnacles or other oysters and algae and tuna kits and any meat left over in them. So it smells a little bit. So you lay them out and then you let the, the winter freeze everything and dry everything out and then they're clean. And then what they do uh, in this one operation on the Quinnipiac, they load up this big barge and they tow plankton nets in the river. And when the wild oyster spat, the seeds coming down river from the beds up upstream, they know that the, they know when the density is right, they li co literally cover the bottom of the oyster shells and all the baby oysters land on them and grow. And then they'll let them grow for a while. Then they scoop them up because it's too polluted in there to grow them. And then they move them out into the cleaner offshore waters. And then they grow them out on their lease sites. 
and then they move them around a couple times in different sizes and it's quite an operation. So they use them basically for a nursery substrate. That's what the shells are for. Okay. Um, can you explain the removal of the dams that will, uh, will that basically explain the removal, what happens when the dams are removed and why were the dams there to begin with and how much change to the flow will happen? So um, it all depends on the dam. Um, dam removal typically are met with resistance in the beginning, like in the Penobscot River. Um, but the salmon were dying out. The alewife runs were terrible. The blueback herring, run, herring runs were terrible. The eels, a lot of stuff wasn't making by. Fish ladders don't work that well. They work okay. Nothing beats a free flowing river. So a lot of these dams were just recreational, like the one in Dana Dam uh, in Wilton, which, you know, it killed a few kids in my neighborhood back in the late 70s that were rafting. It was just for ice skating. And someone just dammed the river and then they had a little warming shack down there and the kids would go ice skating in like the 40s and 50s. Um, so there's no point to that. There's no hydropower being generated. There's no drinking water. It was just a toy. So those are the dams that we should probably just get rid of. And they, they get really hot. So what happens is downstream, all the trout disappear. So I grew up near Dave Brubeck and he had a dam at the top of Comstock Brook, which feeds in in the Norwalk River down by um, Merwin Meadows. And, you know, he, I remember talking to him, I was fishing down there. He said, there used to be trout in here when we first put this in. And he said, people took them all. And I, you know, as I got older, became a biologist, it was like, no, the water was probably 85 degrees because it came off the top. It wasn't a bottom release dam. And it drove all the trout farther down river when it was in the forested pool areas. So these, these ponds are huge thermal polluters. I mean, they just make it impossible for trout to live. I mean, we've lost 75% of our native brook trout in the last 30 years, according to the state biologists. I mean, these dams have just got to go. You got to get this stuff out of here. Drinking water, of course, you have to have that. Uh, hydropower with the best fish passage, if it's good, high efficiency hydropower, there's ways to potentially work with that. Um, but there's so many dams that are completely unnecessary out there just choking the system. And if you go back to, to the Penobscot, there's so many alewives in there now that they allow the lobster fishermen to catch them as bait i mean the runs completely restored when those when those dams went away so there's eagles all over the place and ospreys and there's salmon back and, and not that many salmon but they got other issues but i mean the the sea the river run herring they completely i mean they're, it's incredible and we fixed a culvert in brides brook save the sound did and it went from about a seventy thousand fish run to a four hundred thousand fish alewife wow. run it's the biggest one in the state and that's the one the state now uses to capture alewives and transport them up to all our restoration projects. They got a couple of trucks. They net up a bunch of alewives and they go and seed all these places where we maybe put a fish ladder in or take out a dam just to jumpstart the run. The adults will go back to Bride Brook, but the young born in the river will imprint on that river. If you do it for seven or eight years, you'll, you'll have a run. And we actually had an alewife in nor in at the at the Wilton Dam last year for the first time probably in 200 years, so it's pretty exciting. You know, um, the Mianus chapter of uh, Trout Unlimited's done a great job too. They got blueback herring and herring in there. They did a lot of habitat work. It's really so, cool. uh, I have a question about, that was not in the chat. It's mine. Um, you said some of the individual things that we can do is uh, one of them was living shoreline. Could you explain that? Yeah, so I've been <coughs> traveling the entire coastline of Long Island Sound, basically from the East River, Rikers Island, all the way out. I, I led a biodiversity uh, by New York Heritage dive. I had a, uh, four divers on my boat last summer documenting all the life around Plum Island um, as part of the governor's program out there um, to try and preserve it. And um, it's amazing how many seawalls there are. And so if you think about what will Long Island Sound will be in 2050, when we're basically in statute says we're going to rise 20 inches, you're going to end up losing your beaches, 
the salt marshes are going to have no place to go because they're not going to be able to migrate back inland um, or up the rivers because everything's going to be walled off. There's going to be no place for the horseshoe crabs to find gravelly beaches to spawn on, the sandpipers, nothing. They're not going to have places to probe for food. We're going to end up looking like some of the inner cities, you know, they have like in New Haven and Bridgeport, Stamper, they've got everything's a sheet piling and there's a stream in there somewhere, but it's under blocks and blocks of concrete. It's just a square steel canyon. Um, and I just, I see seawalls all over the place and there's no ecological value in them. Um, and sea level's coming up. So it's a really, if you're gonna protect yourself, it's better to maybe put a reef out there and then some boulder gardens, you know, where the crabs and fish can get in and, you know, make it more natural, make it a, a, a more functioning ecosystem than just steel or concrete or rock. Are they doing that anywhere along our, sh our show lines now? Yeah, I got, I should, I've got some pictures that show, like, there's one house, I don't know, if you're, what was it, that uh, Capra film? where there was like the one little house left in the city surrounded by the skyscraper was as good as it gets, I think it was called. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it was a beautiful, nice, calm lawn with all these native beach plum plantings and a real nice, mellow, modest house and this soft, sandy beach on both sides were just rows of these like uber walls. They're, they're the last holdouts, but we are working on legislation that was introduced uh, about eight days ago in the New York legislature. So I've been doing a little lobbying also in New York City. I do mostly Connecticut and um, Senator uh, Marr, uh, who's a fairly new senator, she introduced a living shoreline bill, which requires shoreline developments now to look at that first, look at the cost benefits, um, you have to make an argument why you're not going to keep the beach natural. You can't just default to, I'm going to put up a big wall and that's, that's it. So um, that's, you know, that's the hope. And I, I saw an economic analysis by a Yale professor on building like long walls, like municipal level walls for protecting roads and things. And the only wall that would, he, he did uh, East Haven and Guilford, the economic analysis there with different wall heights. And the only thing that was affordable to build was a two foot wall. And that would only stop with sea level projection. I think it was only like 60% or 70% effective. So we're still gonna get overtopped every 10 years. You're gonna spend a massive amount of money for the wall and it still wasn't gonna be 100% protection. So we really got to start looking at the economics of this. And you know what a lot of people don't like to talk about is we have to start retreating. They bought some houses in, in West Haven. Uh, we really need to create space for the wildlife and the um, marshes to migrate inland if we want to have a healthy ecosystem. And we need to compensate people for their lost property. I mean, that's what they did in Canada. They just said, look, this river's flooding out. We're tired of giving you federal, we're trying to give you taxpayer money to constantly rebuild. Here's your buyout option one time only. After that, your house gets damaged, you're on your own. And the southeastern United States is doing a lot of that. And actually, it's really bipartisan because Louisiana and Mississippi, um, they are having massive costs with this. And the insurance companies are leaning on everybody because they don't want to pay for any of this stuff. They know it's going to get damaged. And why are you still building there? So it's a real, it's, it's common sense, but it's, you know, if it's your house and you grew up with and it's got a beach view and the town's looking at the grand list and like, wow, this first row of houses is, you know, paying for the Spanish program or whatever, it, or then half the police force, it's, there's a lot of tension there, but we're going to have to do something at some point soon. Bill, thank you so much. This was very interesting. I think we learned a lot. And everybody, Bill's email is in the chat. If you have any questions, please shoot them, shoot them to him directly. Um, I know you are, seem to be always available to at least answer. So thank you again. And thank you everybody for joining us. All right, thank you. Thank you, Martina. Okay, I'm gonna sign off. Bye Good night, all. everybody. <laughs>